Friends, welcome to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It's not difficult for you, but it's nice for me, and we're starting. It was Tuesday evening, and I was lying in bed waiting for my wife, Winnie, to finish in the bathroom and join me. Although our honeymoon was over, Wendy and I continued to make love almost every day. I was hoping she'd be in the mood tonight. I smiled to myself as she strutted into our bedroom. She looked damn beautiful. Wendy is 32 years old, blue-eyed blonde with a runner's build. She has slender curves, a toned stomach, and incredibly long legs that seem capable of hugging me twice. Hi, baby. Can I ask you a favor? What is it? She asked. I replied a couple of times, what will I get in return? You dirty old man. You know what you're going to get. What's the favor, honey? Wendy reached over to her desk and grabbed her iPad before climbing into bed next to me. Snuggling up to me, she said, I'm following this new author on Literatica. His name is Still Yaga, and I think he's a pretty good storyteller. I read a story he posted a few months ago, Joy Meets Her Bull, and I think it's cool. Could you read it so we can talk about it? Wendy handed me her tablet, and I opened the page. I didn't tell her that I'd read a few of the dude's stories and wasn't particularly impressed. There wasn't a lot of love in his stories, and those stories that had love scenes were childish and very unrealistic. I quickly scanned the first page to the end and was thrilled to see that I only had to read two pages of his nonsense. The story was incredibly silly and focused on a rich, dominant black man and his online seduction of a white couple into a cuckold lifestyle. I was hot, and Wendy was holding me on the edge of that very moment. When I noticed that I had a few paragraphs left to finish, I said, I'm going to finish the story. Instead of reading the story to the end, I threw the iPad aside and grabbed Wendy by the waist. Satisfied for the moment, Wendy collapsed onto my chest. I turned us over on our sides, and we snuggled up to each other. Will you do something nasty for me, baby? It's going to be so hot. Wendy whispered in my ear a few moments later. Is it disgusting and hot? What do you need, my love? I want you to eat me, Wendy pleaded. Her big blue eyes stared at me intently. Wendy and I even had love, and before we had sex for the second time, we rested. What's the matter, Wendy? Don't overdo it, my love, she replied. Is this just about you and me, Wendy? Have you ever fantasized about making love to some other guy? No, I promise, she said. This story touched me. For me, the key words were, I promise. I've never seen Wendy cover up the truth, much less lie to me. I hissed in her ear, I'm going to love you until you explode. The next couple of weeks passed. We had our usual love almost every night. One evening Wendy and I finished dinner and were cleaning the kitchen. I had just turned on the dishwasher when I noticed that she was opening a bottle of wine. She poured two glasses, looked at me and asked, Can we sit and talk on the patio? Of course. Let's go. We went through the back sliding door to the patio of our house. We sat across from each other at a table in the backyard. I asked, What happened? I noticed that Wendy's upper chest and neck area turned slightly red when she said, I've been thinking about this story written by a dude and I've read other stories about cuckolds. They really turn me on. When I didn't answer, Wendy asked, What do you think? Last week I read an article about disagreement on the Literatica website. This story was about a married woman who cheated on her husband. A neighbor discovered her infidelity and framed the cheating fool. She was blackmailed and spent the weekend being gang-raped by a group of 20 men on the bachelor weekend. The story was incredibly well-written and turned me on. Just because history excites us doesn't mean we want it to happen. That kind of story is disgusting, Wendy said dismissively. I replied. In real life, it's disgusting, but as a fantasy story, it was cool. After a short pause, Wendy gathered her thoughts and asked, Have you ever thought about the swinger lifestyle? Of course, I replied. Be more specific. Wendy shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know. Do you have any fantasies about swingers? I suppose so, I agreed. It would be hot if you put on this beautiful black dress, put on makeup, and went to the cocktail bar alone. I definitely caught Wendy's attention when I continued. You could flirt and maybe even dance with a little girl, pick her up, bring her home, and let me seduce and use her while you're watching. It's a pretty hot fantasy about swingers, don't you agree? I asked her. It's disgusting, was Wendy's immediate response. 
There's no such shit. I bet I can find over a hundred similar fantasy stories on Literatica. Do you want to bet? Wendy didn't answer, and we both sat in awkward silence for the next few minutes. Finally, I asked, What's the matter, Wendy? When she didn't answer, I asked, You want to cuckold me? Do you want me to watch other men use you? It took a full two minutes before Wendy answered. This idea turns me on like hell, she said. There was a long moment of silence before Wendy asked, Will you do me a favor? I didn't want to commit myself, so I shrugged my shoulders. She continued, Would you consider trying this? I admit that I was more than a little angry, but I restrained myself. Wanting to clarify the situation, I asked, Do you want me to think about watching another man use you? I let the silent tension build, and when Wendy didn't answer, I finally asked, Will you do me a favor? Wendy's eyes narrowed. Assuming she had no choice, she nodded in agreement. I'll think about being humiliated by a sissy cuckold if you think about being a 32-year-old divorce cheater. Who the hell is talking about a divorce? Wendy's immediate response was, Wendy, we're both from divorced families, I explained. We talked about fidelity before we became exclusive and again, on the weekend after you accepted my offer. We swore to be faithful. We made the same vow at our wedding. Wendy's eyes filled with tears as I continued. You married a single man, and I haven't changed, I said. I stood up and took a last sip of wine from my glass. What if it's important for me to try to play cuckold on a date? I heard her words over my shoulder. I turned around and stared at Wendy for a few seconds before lifting my wine glass and staring at him for a long time. With a sharp flick of my wrist, I threw the glass into our stone fire pit. He broke into pieces. Oh my God. Wendy cried out. Your grandmother gave you this glass two days before she died. You cherished him. Looking back at Wendy, I told her, I value a faithful marriage 10,000 times more than a wine glass. But I'll just as easily give it up if you don't keep your promises. It was cold that night before going to bed, and over the next few days everything returned to almost normal. On Wednesday afternoon, a couple of weeks later, my best friend and business partner knocked on the open door of my office. Ben asked, do you have a couple of minutes? Ben and I met in college. He majored in botany, and I studied landscape architecture and design. After graduating from high school, Ben and I bought identical used Ford F-150 pickups and went into business together. I designed and supervised the construction of our facilities, while Ben identified the best plants to decorate my finished project. The first two years were difficult, and we barely survived. By the fifth year, we breathed a sigh of relief and by the 10th anniversary of our partnership, we had a successful small business. Over the years, I met and married Wendy, and Ben married Sherry. We were close as a couple, but Wendy and Sherry didn't immediately find a common language. Wendy works by the book, and she is a registered nurse at our local pediatric hospital. Sherry is a freedom-loving herbalist. She also taught dancing a couple of nights a week. Ben and I have been thrilled that the girls have become closer friends over the last couple of years. I said to Ben, yes, give me a second, and pointed to the chair opposite my desk. When I finished calculating the design a few moments later, I looked up and saw that Ben had poured a couple of centimeters of bourbon into two glasses. He headed back to my desk before turning around. He went back to the bookshelf and grabbed a bottle of bourbon. He brought two glasses and a bottle to my table before plopping down into a chair. Is it that bad? I asked. It took Ben a few moments to collect his thoughts, and he asked me a question. Are you familiar with the saying men are from Mars and women are from Venus? I think it was originally the title of the book, I replied. Ben seemed to ignore me and continued. One of the differences between the sexes is the way they talk about love, he said. When men talk about their love life to other men, it is very impersonal. We've known each other for almost 15 years, and all you know about my love life is that I like girls and I love making love. I know just as much about you. He looked at me and asked, Do you agree? I nodded in agreement. Girls are different. When they talk about love, they are incredibly detailed. They share all their delightful details. When girls talk about love, there aren't many secrets. I wasn't sure if I agreed with Ben, but I knew he was trying to say something. Okay, I said, waiting for him to continue. He took a sip from his glass and then pointed at my glass. I followed his example before he continued. I need to talk to you about my love life with Sherry, he said. 
When Ben took a second sip, I didn't need any encouragement. I drained my glass and moved it to refill it. Did you know that shortly after we started dating, Sherry introduced me to the swinger's lifestyle? I shook my head, and Ben continued, Love was completely different for Sherry and me, he said. We fell in love and devoted ourselves to each other, but we attended exchange parties and made love to everyone we liked. I know that our views on love are unusual, but it worked for us. Are you still with me? I replied that I was listening, and Ben continued. Over the past few years, we have changed the situation a little. We are still regular members of a couple of swing bands, but we are studying the dynamics of the hot wife. Do you know what it is? It began to dawn on me what Ben wanted to talk about. Yes, I told him. Sherry meets with other guys and makes love to them. Do you think I screwed up? Ben asked. To be honest, I don't care what two or five or 25 consenting adults do. I really don't care, I told him. But you should know that this kind of shit is not for me. Ben nodded in agreement even before I finished. Sherry was talking to Wendy about the game of hot wifey and cuckold. Over the past couple of months, Wendy's interest has gone from slightly surprised to hypnotized. I told Ben about the incident after reading the story of the dude and told him about our quarrel on the patio in the backyard. I ended with the words, I told Wendy that I would consider the benefits of playing cuckold if she considered the consequences including divorce. What was her reaction? Ben wanted to know. I sighed and said, you just used the word hypnotize. I think that's the perfect word. She's hypnotized. I shocked Wendy when I mentioned the divorce, but I don't think it had a lasting effect. It's because of Sherry's influence. Ben was right. I felt lost. We're going to have dinner and dance on Friday, Ben reminded me. I think the girls are planning something. My emotions quickly changed from confusion to royal rage. What the hell are they going to do? I don't know. I would have told you if I had known. It just makes my stomach clench that they're taking steps to get you interested in dating a hot wife. I'm going to cancel Friday night, I said, anger building in my voice. This is bullshit. We both took a sip of our bourbon before Ben said he had a suggestion. My dead eyes were fixed on Ben. He shrugged his shoulders and said, I would think about letting their plan come to fruition. Don't delay the inevitable. Face the truth. I've been thinking about Ben's offer. It made sense, but not trusting my voice, I nodded. Ben could tell that I was overwhelmed with emotion. He said to me, you know I'll have your back. Isn't it? I forced a half smile and said, yes. Thank you. Ben poured me a third drink, got up, and headed for my office door. Before leaving the office, he picked up the bottle and said, that's enough for today. I'll return the bottle to you in the morning. On Friday night, Wendy and I met Ben and Sherry at the Twilight Room, an upscale steakhouse. As usual, when the four of us get together, we had a great time. To begin with, each of us had a cocktail, and at dinner we drank two bottles of wine. I noticed that Ben followed my example and hardly drank. The girls shared most of the wine. The dinner was delicious. We ordered an exquisite dessert and divided it into four parts. I was relieved when we were able to finish a wonderful dinner without any negative discussions, but I suspected Ben was right. The girls had a plan, and it was supposed to be implemented in the twilight room while we were dancing. Wanting to test my theory, I asked, would anyone mind if we went to the tumbleweed for a country dance instead of the twilight room? I'm in the mood to dance a little in a row. Wendy's face showed deep concern, far more than a simple change of plan could justify. Sherry saved the day by saying, Chris, I've told a few girlfriends that we're going to be in the twilight room. I would not like any of them to come alone and have no one to sit with. I would appreciate it if we could stay in the twilight room. As a gentleman, I agreed. Ben caught my eye. He also noticed Wendy's strange behavior. Since Sherry is a dance instructor, she has spent a lot of time and effort training Ben and me. We are actually very good dancers and enjoy ourselves on the dance floor. When the music started, the four of us were in each other's arms. We danced for about 30 minutes before Sherry and Ben returned to our table. When the next dance was coming to an end, Wendy said, let's take a break. I need to catch my breath. Are you sure, love? I could dance with you all night. Wendy said, I'm ready to drink my drink. Pulling her to me, I said to Wendy, I feel intimacy when we dance. Will you promise to dance every dance tonight? Wendy didn't answer my question. Instead, she kissed me on the cheek, took my hand, and led me back to our table. 
As we approached our friends, I saw Sherry and Wendy exchange an unspoken sign. As soon as we returned to our table and sipped our drinks, a handsome man about five years older than us came up to the table. Addressing his question to Sherry, he held out his hand and asked, May I ask you to dance? Sherry smiled and looked at Ben and asked, Do you mind? Ben nodded approvingly, and when Sherry returned to the dance floor, Ben gave me a very aggressive look. I was on my guard. A moment later, a second man came up to our table and asked Wendy, Would you like to dance with me? Wendy was thoughtful when she turned to me. I don't want to be rude, was her weak reply. Do you mind? I looked at my wife and said, Five minutes ago, we agreed to save all our dancing for each other. I stood up and held out my hand to her, saying to the guy, No, thanks. I'm going to dance with my wife. I thought Ben was going to choke on his drink when he was trying to hold back a smile. I took Wendy back to the dance floor and we danced five more songs. I noticed Sherry and Wendy exchanging a few disappointed glances. When Wendy insisted that we rest, we joined Ben and Sherry. Neither of them looked happy, and I suspected that they had exchanged a few angry words. After a short rest, Sherry said, Chris, we haven't danced yet. Shall we go? Wendy nodded approvingly and was shocked when I said, I'm in the mood to spend as much time as I can dancing with my wife. I slapped Ben on the shoulder and said, Take your girlfriend there. We'll join you soon. Two songs later, a man who had previously danced with Sherry came up to us. He said to me, I noticed your girlfriend tapping her toe. Would you mind if I asked her to dance? I told him, My wife is resting. We'll join our friends. I pointed to Ben and Sherry when she's ready to dance again. Thank you. Sherry and Ben returned to our table after the next dance. Sherry grabbed Wendy's wrist and announced, We're going to the ladies' room. When they left, I asked Ben, Do you know these two assholes? He nodded and said, I know the taller one. He's a friend of Sherry's. A hookup buddy? I wanted to clarify. Yes. Why were you both angry when Wendy and I came back? Ben smiled and said to me, Sherry wanted me to get you to dance with her so that this asshole could spend time dancing with Wendy. I was furious and hissed. What are they trying to achieve? Sherry convinced Wendy that you'd be thrilled to watch her dance with other men. This is the first step to a date with a hot wife. It's more like the first step to divorce. That's what I told Sherry, Ben admitted. Listen, I said, staring at Ben. They're planning something in the bathroom. Whatever it is, Wendy will directly ignore my wishes to spend every dance with her. If that happens, I'm leaving. I expect you to give me at least a 20-minute head start before you take Wendy home. Depending on how angry I get, you might have a new roommate for a few days. As Ben said, I saw Sherry and Wendy coming out of the bathroom. When they reached the dance floor, Sherry took Wendy's hand, led her onto the dance floor, and they started dancing together. Ben and I have seen them dancing together many times. They were damn beautiful. Most nights I'd love to watch them from my seat. But tonight wasn't that kind of evening. Like sharks scenting blood, the two jerks approached the girls and joined them in a fast dance. They're going to stay there until the next slow dance. Right? Frowning, Ben said, that's my guess. I watched two more fast dances in which all the participants were talking to each other, keeping a respectful distance. When the next slow dance began, each woman melted into the arms of her partner. I looked at Ben and reminded him that I needed a 20-minute head start. Wendy was wrapped in an intimate dancing embrace when I got up, put on a sports jacket, and headed for the door. I never looked back. I deliberately turned off my phone when I was driving out of the parking lot. I was driving fast, but I didn't want to be stopped. I returned home and threw enough clothes for a couple of days into my gym bag. When Wendy and I go on a date, she doesn't take her keys with her. I locked the back door with an additional latch and rechecked our windows. I turned off the garage door opener and manually locked the garage door. I knew Ben and Sherry had a key to our front door. They didn't have a key to the deadbolt, which we only used when we went on vacation. As soon as the house was closed, I went to the Marriott Hotel on the other side of the city. I didn't sleep on Friday night, but instead of tossing and turning, I made a list of things to do if Wendy and I were going to break up. I didn't want to disturb anyone's sleep on a Saturday morning, so I waited until 10 a.m. to turn on the phone and make a couple of calls. I called two close friends who had recently divorced and found out the name of the best divorce lawyer. Fortunately, she worked on Saturday mornings, 
and I was able to make an appointment on Monday at 7 a.m. After making an appointment, I checked the messages and found 14 voice messages and 26 text messages. All were from Wendy or Sherry, except for one from Ben. I'm going to stay at the office until I hear from you. I sent him a reply message. I can be there in 10 minutes. I found Ben in his office. He looked as bad as I did. Wendy is panicking. That's how it should be. I have a meeting with a divorce lawyer on Monday. Damn it. Are you really going to divorce her? I don't know what else to do. Ben. At the very least, I want to know my options. Ben and I sat for two more hours. We talked about the possibility of reconciliation. However, if that were to happen, I needed a plan to make sure that Sherry wouldn't continue to influence Wendy. Ben agreed to help me and would be my eyes and ears. When he went home, I suggested, you can tell Wendy that we can talk. Tell her she can come to my house after her shift at the hospital on Monday. Then we'll talk. On Sunday, I met with a divorced friend who recommended his lawyer on his yacht in Long Island Sound. We swam all day, and in the evening I treated him to a lobster dinner before returning to the Marriott Hotel. I was in a surprisingly good mood. The next day at 7 a.m., I met with Bev Carr's lawyer, and she explained to me my rights in the divorce process. She recommended that I talk to Wendy and try to sort things out. I knew this was an option and hoped it would work, but I gave Bev a deposit and asked her to draft a divorce petition. I was hoping I wouldn't need it, but I wanted it ready just in case. Bev also recommended making an appointment with a local private investigator. Depending on the results of our conversation, a private investigator could confirm that Wendy remained within the framework of our concluded marriage. I didn't get to the office until 11 a.m. As soon as I crossed the threshold, Sherry pounced on me and demanded, Where the hell have you been? The frustration that had accumulated over the weekend exploded, and I took two quick steps in her direction. Ben was just as fast. He hugged me tightly and pressed me against the wall. Don't touch her, Chris. Nothing good will happen if you do this. When I abruptly turned around and looked at Ben, I saw that he was taking care of my interests. My friend really had my back, even when his wife was involved. When Ben and I got out of it, I growled at Sherry. Get the fuck out of here. If you don't leave in a minute, I'll call the police. Chris, I'm only here to help. I exploded. Fuck you. Darling, the only thing you care about is turning my wife into a fool like you. I'm not a fool, you fool. Ben and I have an agreement and a perfectly acceptable relationship. You really have an agreement. You and Ben both agree that you can be a cheater, I said. After being silent for a moment, I decided to continue. Leave me alone, darling, I said. I need to decide if I'm going to file for divorce. Sherry was standing in the middle of our office when I turned and left, slamming the door of my office. It's time to plan. My conversation with Wendy was disappointing. On Monday evening, I returned to the locked house. Wendy arrived at exactly 7 p.m. and burst through the front door shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When she threw herself into my arms and begged, please forgive me, I thought that maybe there was a chance that we could repair the damage. Let's talk, I suggested when Wendy loosened her tight embrace. Together we went to the kitchen table. Have you really met with a divorce lawyer? Wendy asked. Nodding slowly, I said to Wendy, I want to find out my rights and confirm that the house and business will remain with me, since I acquired them before we got married. Chris, you are welcome. I don't want to talk about divorce. I promised myself that I wouldn't mention it as an opportunity, and in the end, that's the first thing I ask. She calmed down before asking, can I say a few things? When I nodded in agreement, Wendy said, I'm ashamed that I let these silly fantasy stories, along with Sherry and Ben's lifestyle, affect our marriage. I told my parents the full and honest truth, and they are ashamed of me too. I made an appointment with a psychologist through my hospital. Our first meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, and I will meet with her twice a week until I can collect my thoughts and figure out how I became so stupid. I smiled at Wendy because the consultation was something I would have insisted on. I also called Sherry. That's how I found out that you went to a divorce lawyer. I told Sherry I wasn't going to talk to her for a while. It doesn't really matter, but she agreed that it was a good idea if I expect to establish a relationship with you. She ended with a plea, Chris, we can't fix this if we're not together. First of all, will you let me sleep in the guest bedroom? You are welcome. We didn't have love until next weekend. 
Wendy returned to our bedroom in the middle of the second month. We've been close almost every day for the last couple of weeks. We made love half the time. By the fifth month, we were as close to normal as I ever expected. I was completely happy. It was a pleasant surprise. One day I pulled into the parking lot of our office, and as I was getting out of my truck, Ben came out of the office door. With a shrug, Ben indicated that he wanted me to follow him. Together we walked 50 meters to the first of the 25 greenhouses that we used to grow Ben's plants. I followed Ben to his orchid room, where he grew his award-winning orchids. I silently watched him for over 15 minutes while he studied a new batch of crossed flowers. Without looking up from his work, he said, I canceled our trip to the Orlando conference. Ben and I were scheduled to attend a four-day industry conference starting at the end of the week. We rarely went to these events together. More often than not, they either covered the production side of the business, and Ben was present, or the construction side, and I walked. It seemed like a good combination this year, and Ben and I talked about the trip for weeks. I had an unpleasant feeling when he continued. Sherry and her latest jerk thought I was asleep last night, he said. They were discussing the dinner Sherry is having at my house on Friday while we're gone. Wendy's coming, and the other asshole is with her. I was surprised by my emotions. I was angry, but it wasn't the ferocious anger I had six months ago. Instead, I was mostly tired, sick and exhausted. I took out my phone and called Bev Carr, my lawyer. Surprisingly, I was able to talk to her immediately. I was able to confirm that a divorce petition had been prepared. I told Bev that I would arrange through the processing server for the documents to be collected in the next few days. When I was about to switch off, Ben asked, let me talk to her. I listened to Ben introduce himself. He told Bev that he wanted to prepare the divorce papers and that they needed to be ready by the end of the week. Apparently, Bev agreed and told Ben to come to her office immediately. This week Wendy worked the shift from 4 p.m. to midnight. It wasn't hard to stay away from the cheater. On Wednesday, she wrote, I haven't heard from you or seen you for two days. Are you okay? I waited for her shift to start. She wasn't allowed to use her cell phone. And replied, busy. Wendy tried to call me on Thursday morning. I ignored the call, and she didn't leave a voice message, but sent an SMS. Come home for lunch. We can make love quickly before you go to the airport. I waited until 1.30 before sending a reply message. I'm leaving for the airport for my place of work. She called three times in a row. I ignored every call and didn't listen to the voicemail she left after the third call. Apart from sending her a message that we had successfully arrived in Florida, a lie. I ignored all messages from Wendy. On Friday afternoon, we were sitting at Ben's neighbor's dinner table. The neighbor went on vacation, but agreed to give Ben access to his house. Ben and I were sitting with our private investigator, Lou. The fourth person at the table was my old friend Larry Baxter. Larry is a sergeant at our local police department, and he has agreed to serve the divorce papers. We had a significant advantage when Larry was on our team, because he was 190 centimeters tall and weighed 120 kilograms. He was a giant. We had two laptops on the table, connected via Wi-Fi to audio slash visual cameras strategically scattered around Ben's house. We watched Wendy arrive at 5.30 p.m. The fool was wearing my favorite blue dress with straps. She couldn't wear a bra with her dress, and I suspected she wasn't wearing panties either. These jerks arrived in different cars, but coordinated it so that they arrived at the same time. The first part of the evening was a dinner party. They were talking in the living room and drinking cocktails and wine. Sherry served a delicious shrimp pasta that I've tried many times over the years. As the dinner progressed, the conversation became a little risky and then dirty. When cherry pie and ice cream were served for dessert, the conversation became obscene. At one point, we heard Sherry ask Wendy, who would you like to be your partner tonight? She replied, since I'm only going to do it once, I think Billa, and then John. Sherry clapped her hands, and Bill and John applauded and high-fived each other. When Wendy continued, everyone in both houses was surprised. She said, and after that Bill, John and Sherry are together. Wendy smiled proudly as her new friends continued to cheer. We immediately left the neighbor's house and entered Ben's house less than 90 seconds later. Ben led the way to the dining room. Sherry was the first to realize what was happening and moaned, Damn it! The two jerks were grinning like idiots until they saw Larry enter the room, 
dressed in a size XXXL police uniform, Wendy's eyes were round as saucers, and her jaw dropped when Larry approached her. I'm sorry to have to do this, Wendy, but you're officially served. Wendy's eyes darted between Larry and me as he placed the documents in front of her. Larry tried to continue, but Wendy was confused. Finally, in a loud voice, Larry said, Wendy. When Larry caught her attention, he continued, Wendy, there's also an injunction keeping you away from Chris, his house, and his business. If you approach Chris or two properties closer than 150 meters, you will be arrested. Do you understand? Wendy could barely nod. As a friend, I would advise you to hire a lawyer. Finally, Larry concluded, Sherry, you're officially served. Sherry was stunned when the second set of papers was placed in front of her. The court gave Ben 10 days to get his property out of the house. Do you understand? What the hell is this? Sherry yelled at Ben. Ben just gave Sherry a scornful look. You're also not allowed to get closer than 150 meters to his business, Larry continued. When the fireworks ended, I laughed. It was a strange sound, considering the circumstances. When I got everyone's attention, I said to the jerks, pointing at Wendy, Hey guys, this fool likes to be used with a fist. Wendy began to sob hysterically. Larry's booming voice said, Chris, stop it. Now, Wendy is quite emotional. Returning his attention to the visitors, he said, If you'll excuse us, we're leaving. Enjoy the leftovers of dinner. An hour after we left, I got a text from Larry. Wendy left five minutes after we did, he said. Looks like Sherry let both assholes stay the night. He also sent me the registration details of the cars of these two jerks. A week later, it was a beautiful Tuesday evening when I pulled into the parking lot at Lesmore Park. More than 30 softball matches were held there. I was sitting in the stands, watching the game and getting some fresh air. After that, I followed the players to a bar, a local hangout. The team took a table in the far corner next to another group of baseball players and began exchanging stories about their athletic achievements. I waited five minutes and took a sip of the local Indian pale ale before approaching the group. Are you Bill Weston? Right? I asked. What's it to you? He wanted to know. I told him, your wife has just gone into premature labor. A neighbor took her to the hospital. Bill grabbed his phone and looked at it. Deb would have left me a message if she was having contractions. You're full of shit. I was with her when it happened, I explained. I helped her get to her neighbor's car. Do you know how it happened? Bill asked. I pulled the flash drive out of my front pocket. I showed it to Bill before I threw it to him. I said, she went into labor when I showed her the video of you using Sherry Wilson. She never got to the third video, the one where you use Sherry with your buddy John. I threw the second flash drive to John Malloy and told him, your wife Jane wants me to tell you, don't come home. She's going to hand you the divorce papers sometime next week. You're the cuckold from Sherry's house, John said, finally recognizing me. I'm not a cuckold. I handed that cheater the divorce papers before she let you into the cesspool between her legs. But your actions led to my divorce, just as my actions today will lead to yours. You bastard. John growled, getting to his feet. Bill also stood up along with a couple of other teammates. Before they could start anything, we heard, Gentlemen, is there any problem? All six to seven of Larry Baxter's people came up to me. He continued, I am a sergeant of the local police, not on duty. He looked at me and winked. It looks like you're not welcome here, he told me. It would probably be better if you left. I replied, yes, sir. And as I was heading for the exit, I heard Bill scream. We're not done, asshole. I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. Bastard. The last thing I heard as I left was, I'm putting you under arrest. A week later, on a beautiful spring Saturday morning, I was sitting in my kitchen sipping coffee when the doorbell rang. Wendy was standing on the porch with three men. Hi, Chris, Wendy said. Thanks for lifting the injunction. So I can get my stuff back. Hello. I nodded back. Wendy reached out her hand and tried to hand me a couple of sheets of lined paper. This is a list of what I would like. Take whatever you want, I said over my shoulder, heading back to my coffee mug on the kitchen table. I was sitting on the patio in the backyard when I heard the sliding door open about 30 minutes later. Wendy stood in the open doorway and held our wedding album in her hands. Do you want to share our wedding photos? She wanted to know. No, thanks, Wendy. 
I meant what I said. Take whatever you want. I really don't care. There were tears in her eyes as she turned back into the house. It was about 2.15 p.m. when the door opened again. Wendy brought a glass of wine and a can of the same local craft beer that was on the table. Putting a glass of wine on the table, she opened a can of beer and poured it into my glass. She asked, Can we talk, for one beer? Wanting to be an asshole, I took my glass and drank the beer in one gulp. I was stunned by the level of surprise and sadness in Wendy's eyes. When she started sobbing, I said, Stop crying, Wendy. We can talk. I got up and went to the kitchen. After filling the ice bucket, I put an open bottle of Chablis in it, along with two more bottles of beer, and returned to the patio. When I sat down, Wendy said, I've never had love with them. I sighed and told her, You've been scheming, lying, and cheating on me ever since you made me read that stupid story. The only reason you didn't have love is because I caught you. While Wendy was taking a healthy sip of wine, I asked, Tell me about Sherry's seduction. Sherry wasn't trying to seduce me. She didn't just try. She managed to seduce you, I replied. Besides not forcing you to spread your legs in front of her asshole friends, she seduced you in all other ways. Chris, I don't want to argue. I'm not arguing, I said. I'm just telling you how I see things. Letting Sherry seduce you was ten times worse than being seduced by a man. Wendy looked more than a little confused. So she asked, Will you tell me what you're thinking? I waited a few seconds and took a long sip of the cool beer. I'd be devastated if you let a man seduce you. I imagine the first flirtation together at work, at the gym, or anywhere. Eventually, flirting would turn into attraction, a date, and finally intimacy. It would ruin me and our marriage. But I understand how someone can be seduced into an affair. But that's not what Sherry did, I continued. Instead, Sherry convinced you that loving any man would have a positive effect on our marriage. When Wendy tried to interrupt me, I waved her away. Don't start, Wendy, I said. I'm not saying that Sherry was going to set you up with an 80-year-old man, but there was nothing special about the two jerks she invited to dinner. They were nobody. Wendy stared at the countertop for a long time before reluctantly admitting that my thoughts were correct. Everything sounded so exciting coming from Sherry, Wendy said. She talked about the anticipation of swing parties and all the crazy things she was exposed to too. Sherry admitted that she liked dating a hot wife even more. She felt stronger going to the bar with Ben, flirting and dancing with men while he watched, and finally choosing her date for the night. That's what I'm getting at, Wendy. Sherry went to those bars and picked up a man she didn't know, I said. On those dates, any man was better than Ben. It's fucking disgusting, just like your date at dinner at Sherry's house. After a short pause, Wendy asked, Why is Ben divorcing Sherry? In many ways, for the same reason that I'm divorcing you. He no longer trusts or respects her. She deliberately ruined the marriage of his best friend and business partner, and he doesn't want to be married to such a nasty person. We both paused for a while and thought about our predicament. I know I've been completely unfair to you. You've been warning me since the first night you read that stupid story, but Ben is being unfair to Sherry. They had an agreement. I shrugged and said to Wendy, they did have an agreement, but it didn't include ruining my life. What Sherry had done was beyond the scope of their agreement. Besides, I don't think Ben was very happy in a cuckold relationship. Did he tell you that? Wendy wanted to know. I confessed, no. But can you imagine a man who gets good satisfaction from watching his wife make love to another man? I cannot. After another short pause, I asked, I thought everything was going back to normal when you started seeing a therapist. What happened? I saw Wendy's jaw clench as she considered my question. Finally, she told me, I haven't spoken to Sherry in weeks. Eventually we started texting and talking. After a few more weeks, we started meeting once or twice a week for a cup of coffee. When I didn't answer, she continued, one afternoon she came into the cafe and she was beaming. I asked her if she had just been to the gym. Sherry told me in great detail that she spent the day with three college guys. They took turns using it all day. Wendy shrugged and finished with the words, I couldn't get it out of my head. My friend was the embodiment of a literary fantasy. I think thanks for being honest, I replied. It's still hard for me to come to terms with the fact that my idiocy led to two divorces. Two? I laughed quite hard. What's so funny? Wendy wanted to know. 
Your idiocy has led to seven divorces. How the hell did you figure that out? Wendy asked. You and me. I held up one finger. Ben and Sherry, I said, holding up my other finger. After you left Sherry's party, she took those two jerks to her bedroom. Ben set up the camera. I took the video to their wives. Both filed for divorce. I held up my third and ring fingers. Wendy's eyes widened when I admitted that there were cameras in Sherry's bedroom. She asked, Do you have a video of? A sudden sob stopped her from finishing. Do I have a video recording of last Sunday afternoon? Yes, I have. Three of the five guys were married. I shared a video with their three very unhappy wives. They are all in the process of filing for divorce. You've caused seven divorces, Wendy. I got up from the table in the courtyard and walked out without looking back. I went through the patio door, locked it behind me, and pulled the curtains on the door. Eight years later, it was only 9.30 p.m. After the men helped clean up the backyard and the women did the housework, about 50 guests dispersed after a very festive day dedicated to Ben's 40th birthday. Our wives were curled up on the couch in the living room and relaxing. They've been there for the last hour. Ben and I were together on the patio in the backyard. We were sitting by his fireplace and sipping a very expensive bourbon that someone had given Ben. Do you remember you told me that men are not supposed to talk in detail about their love life? I asked. Ben chuckled and said, Maybe I'll remember part of that conversation. I asked, Are you and Abby? The rest was left unsaid. Ben was already smiling and shaking his head. We are faithful to each other and monogamous. I raised a toast to my friend and said, I'm glad. We stared at the fire for a few minutes before Ben confessed. I have come to the conclusion that there is not much love in such a relationship. When we heard the patio door open, Ben and I turned around and saw his eight-month pregnant wife, Abby, take his three-year-old son out the door. They were followed by my wife, Brittany, who is seven months pregnant. Brittany was holding our sleeping two-year-old daughter in her arms. It's time to go, Chris. I'm tired, Britt said. Ben and I were smiling when we turned to each other. He raised his glass and toasted, to two happy old farts. End.